I met a girl on a dating app, and she was really pretty, like the most beautiful girl I had ever seen. She looked perfect, a real 10 out of 10. Looking at her profile made me dream about so many things, but I think I was getting lost in a dream world every time I saw her pictures. All her photos were taken in big fancy rooms, like the ones you'd see in old movies about ancient Greece, with big pillars, statues of gods and all that. It was crazy. Some photos made it look like she lived in those places. There were also pictures of her with very expensive cars, like Bentleys and Rolls Royces, and with her family. I didn't think much of it because lots of people try to show off online and pretend to have things they don't, even editing their photos to make it look real. But I really wanted to meet her because she was so pretty, and I couldn't deny it. She was really cute. So I sent her a message. I should mention that I'm quite tall, six foot five, and I think I'm good looking. I own a business but didn't talk about it in my profile, so I was surprised when she answered me. She told me about a beach party she was going to, and I decided to go with her. When I got there, I didn't know anyone, everyone there spoke in a fancy way, and I felt like I didn't belong. Then she introduced me to her dad, and that's when things got really weird. Her dad had no idea I was coming to the party. He gave me a look, up and down, with a mix of disgust and confusion as if I didn't belong. Just to let you know, I'm white, and I was 21 at the time, though I'm 24 now. I couldn't understand why he looked at me like that, feeling as if I was being unfairly judged without any reason. The girl tried to calm her father down, speaking in a language I couldn't recognize. It sounded old, maybe Latin, or an ancient form of English from the 1400s. I felt totally out of place. This beach party was nothing like the usual ones with summer songs, drums, and rap. Instead, it was filled with classical music. They had their own private part of the beach next to a big house that opened directly onto a dock. They even had boats tied up nearby. Focusing back on her dad, who kept sizing me up with that confused look, I noticed something odd. Many people at the party wore rings with family crests, like symbols or signs of belonging to some secret group. Eventually, her dad made me leave, yelling at his daughter after. I guess he was angry I was there without his permission. After escorting me to the sidewalk away from the beach, she briefly explained. Her dad, a baron, didn't want me at the party because he wasn't informed. She looked sorry, saying her dad got mad because she thought it was okay to invite friends since her mom agreed, but her dad believed it was too risky and outsiders weren't allowed. That event turned out to be my scariest dating experience. I'm just relieved they didn't decide to kidnap me for some weird ritual or experiment. Truly a relief. I once went out with a man, Mike, whom I didn't share much in common with, but I decided to give it a try. We agreed to meet at a local pub, and when I arrived, Mike had already finished two large glasses of beer, yet seemed completely clear-headed, which was odd. We spent some time chatting. He was friendly, but I wasn't feeling a spark between us. I was ready to call it a night, but he persuaded me to join him for one more drink at another pub, even though it was still early, around 8 p.m. I hesitantly agreed. At the next pub, we found ourselves sitting close to a couple who were kissing passionately. Mike turned to me with a strange look and asked how I thought people around us would react if we started kissing too. I sensed where this was heading and attempted to brush it off with a laugh suggesting nobody would really care. He pushed back, saying we definitely should not kiss, which I agreed to, feeling uneasy. I excused myself to the bathroom, hoping for a break from the tension. Returning, I found Mike had ordered a shot of alcohol for me, but none for himself, insisting I drink it. I refused, and he became visibly upset, declaring he was ready to leave. By then he had consumed a considerable amount of alcohol, two large glasses of beer, four margaritas, and two additional pints, yet strangely, he showed no signs of being drunk. Concerned for his safety, I questioned if he was sure he could drive. He snapped at me, claiming he was fine, and we left the pub. Surprisingly, he stormed off in the opposite direction of where he parked. Once I got home, I texted him to ensure he made it back safely, considering how much he had drunk. His reply was cold and dismissive, saying, I only date girls I go out with and have fun with. You're not for me. Reflecting on the night, I realized I had narrowly escaped a potentially dangerous situation. Whether he had tampered with the shot or not, 
I couldn't be sure, but his behavior gave me a bad feeling. It was a night that started off mundane but quickly turned into something out of a horror story, reminding me to always trust my instincts. One evening I decided to go out with a man I had recently met, not knowing it would turn into a night I'd never forget for all the wrong reasons. We chose a local eatery for our dinner, a place that seemed cozy enough for a first date. However, as soon as we were seated, his behavior toward our server, a kind lady named Anna, was nothing short of mean. Right from the start, I sensed something was off. He would snap at her over the smallest things, making me uneasy. This was a clear warning sign for me, but unfortunately, it was just the beginning. As we began eating, he shifted the conversation to a friend of his who had once worked for my father, but had been let go. I had to sit there, listening to him badmouth my dad, a man he had never even met. My relationship with my dad is strong, and hearing this stranger criticize him was almost too much. I was on the edge of leaving right then and there, feeling trapped in an awkward and uncomfortable situation with someone who clearly lacked any sense of respect or decency. What made matters worse was his endless bragging about himself. He claimed to be the best at everything he did, showing no interest in anyone else, least of all me. Whenever I tried to share my thoughts, he would either ignore me or rudely interrupt, only to get visibly upset when I decided to leave a generous tip for Anna. In my country, tipping isn't common, since service charges are included in meal prices. It's only done as a gesture of appreciation for exceptional service. Despite this, I felt it was necessary to apologize for his rudeness through that small act of kindness. He had the nerve to call me naive, accusing me of being too influenced by American culture, which left me bewildered. The date was a disaster. Despite making it through the meal, he found a way to argue over the smallest of things. Anna, our server, caught my eye several times throughout the evening, mouthing the words, Are you okay? I realized I could have excused myself at any moment, perhaps claiming a visit to the restroom, and left him there. Yet I stayed, trapped by social conventions and my disbelief at his audacity. After I left the tip, his anger flared even more, berating me for my actions. I sat there, questioning everything. Who was this man? Why did I agree to this date? I needed to get out of there. I once worked at a small diner with a guy named Mike. We both waited tables there. We had been working together for a couple of months before I found a better job elsewhere. Despite everything, Mike was the one I missed the most from that diner. He had a way with words and could make any conversation interesting. I really liked hanging out with him. To paint a clearer picture, I'm quite tall for a woman, standing at 5'11". Mike, on the other hand, was short and thin, with roots in Puerto Rico. He barely reached 5'2", which is really short compared to me. Plus, he was younger by two years. He was 19 and I was 21. Maybe that's why the thought of him being interested in me in a romantic way never crossed my mind. In my eyes, he was strictly a friend, nothing more. Around a month after I left the diner job, Mike got in touch. He suggested we should go out for dinner to catch up, and I thought it was a great idea. I did miss his company. We picked a day that worked for both of us. Due to the traffic in our city, I arrived 45 minutes late. We decided to meet at a local Italian place, not unlike Olive Garden. We spent the dinner talking non-stop, and he filled me in on all that had happened since I'd left. It was genuinely nice, and when it came time to pay, he insisted on covering the bill. Despite my protests, I couldn't help but admire his kindness. After dinner, Mike asked if I wanted to watch the new Avengers movie with him. I was excited to see it, so I agreed immediately. We went to one of those places where you can drink while watching a movie. Oddly enough, he got into my car, and I ended up driving us there. I offered to buy the movie tickets, but he insisted on buying us some drinks. The movie was enjoyable, especially the first half. However, during a tense scene where Thor was in danger, Mike suddenly held my hand. At first I was baffled, wondering if he was just scared and not realizing what he was doing. Could this be how friends act in movies? It took me a minute to understand that Mike saw this as a date, while I had no such intentions. I didn't reciprocate the hand-holding, leaving him probably thinking I was terrible at showing affection. I just sat there, not knowing what to do. I couldn't focus on the movie anymore because all I could think about was his hand holding mine. It felt weird and wrong. 
I was stuck between wanting to finish the movie and wanting to escape the awkwardness of holding hands. I came up with a plan to use the bathroom as an excuse to get away. After I returned, I kept my hands to myself, hoping he'd get the hint. But it didn't work. He reached over, grabbed my hand again, and this time our fingers were locked together. It was even more uncomfortable than before. The movie eventually ended, and thankfully, he didn't try to kiss me. I thought I was finally free from the awkwardness as we left the theater. But I had forgotten we took my car together, and I still had to drive him back to the restaurant where we met. The drive back was filled with small talk about how great the movie was. When we arrived, I quickly said goodbye, hoping he'd just get out of the car and leave. But he didn't move. Then, out of nowhere, he tried to kiss me. It was the longest second of my life. I pulled away as fast as I could. He seemed confused and asked what was wrong. I was at a loss for words, mumbling something about not wanting to. I felt terrible, as if I had led him on without meaning to. His reaction was a mix of disappointment and embarrassment as he struggled to open the car door to leave. After he left, I drove home, replaying the night in my head and realizing how clueless I had been. It was obvious he thought it was a date, and I was just oblivious. I promised myself to be more aware in the future, though I wasn't sure I could keep that promise. Despite the awkward date, Mike remained a friend. He even got married a couple of years later, but would still meet up for coffee if I was in town. We never spoke of that night again, as if it had been erased from our memories. Mike was a good person, and this experience taught me an important lesson about communication. For anyone out there, if you're asking someone out, make sure to be clear it's a date. Not everyone might understand your intentions, and it's better to be explicit to avoid any confusion or awkward situations. In the late 2000s, I met a girl online and we planned to go out. When I got to her place, I found the door slightly open. There was a small dog, maybe a puppy, running up and down the hallway, tied to a leash that seemed too big for it. I gently picked up the dog, and that's when she shouted from inside, Hey! You must be the guy I'm meeting! How are you? She looked at me with a hurried look, and asked if I could quickly take the dog out, because it needed to pee before we left. I found myself walking the dog, puzzled by how the night was turning out. I thought I was going to have a romantic evening, but there I was, acting like I was her helper. The dog did its business quickly. It was an adorable little thing, a mix that looked a bit like those tiny chihuahuas, barely tall enough to reach my knees. After the dog finished, I carried it back upstairs, ready to start the evening properly. The girl seemed really scattered, her hair was all over the place, and she looked like she was in a rush. Still, she was quite beautiful, definitely catching my eye despite the chaos. I was young and eager, drawn in by her looks and the unexpected situation. She hurried back inside her apartment for a moment, realizing she'd left her phone and purse behind. After locking up her place, we headed down to my car. That's when I started to feel something was off. The atmosphere felt tense, and she seemed more interested in treating me like a confidant than a date. All the way to the car, she kept talking about her day's troubles and how stressed she felt. It didn't take long for the conversation to shift to her not wanting to go out anymore. Instead, she suggested we just go back to my place. Her behavior was odd, making the night feel more like a session for sharing worries than a date. It was clear this wasn't going to be the usual evening out I had imagined. She didn't say it directly, but her words were something like, Can we just go to your place? I'm not in the mood for dinner outside. At that moment, I felt stuck because saying no would mean asking her to leave the car. So, I ended up taking her to my apartment. I lived with a roommate who wasn't home, which was a relief, but I was unsure what to do next. My fridge was almost empty, and it seemed like our only option was to watch TV. I didn't expect what happened next. The drive to my place took about 20 minutes. We parked the car near my building and went up to my apartment. I turned on the TV and we both sat on the couch. She seemed to relax a bit, letting out a big sigh as if she was dropping a heavy load of worry and tension. Her behavior was more like a protective parent than someone I was interested in dating. With the TV noise in the background, she began to open up about her life. She told me she had just gotten out of a marriage 
having had a big fight with her husband which led to their divorce. Her life seemed to unravel before her eyes. While we were talking, she even laughed bitterly about how everything was falling apart for her. After about ten minutes I realized I didn't want her there. It felt like she was trying to use me for support. Then about fifteen minutes into our talk her phone rang. She quickly got up from the couch to answer it. She looked really stressed during the call. I couldn't tell if she was talking to her ex-husband or someone else she didn't want to talk to. But the whole call gave off a very bad feeling. I could almost hear every word she said and even catch bits of what the person on the other end was saying. After hanging up, she told me her landlord was kicking her out and moving her to a different apartment temporarily. She looked at me as if she expected me to offer her a place to stay. I could see the expectation in her eyes, but I chose to ignore it. It was very uncomfortable, and I immediately understood her plan. This whole meeting was arranged so she could use me for her benefit. From the bits she shared about her past relationship, it seemed like she had taken advantage of a guy who was well off. I knew I needed to get her out of my apartment quickly, so I lied to make it easier. I promised to help her move, send her money, and take care of her dog. Eventually we agreed she would leave because my roommate was returning soon. As I walked her downstairs, I realized I had to drive her back since we didn't go to the restaurant we initially planned to. During the drive, she kept hinting that I should help her financially emphasizing her tough situation. The whole evening felt wrong. I had been excited about this date, feeling an attraction to her, probably swayed by her looks. It seemed like she used her appearance to manipulate men, giving off a disturbing vibe. When we got to her place, she tried to convince me to come up and help her pack for her move. I refused, saying I had to return quickly because my roommate was locked out. I promised to stay in touch and help from a distance. Then I drove away relieved to escape the situation. Back at my apartment, my roommate was already there. I shared the entire story with him, and he was shocked by what I had gone through. I felt fortunate to have escaped such an awkward situation. Looking back, it's a story that I sometimes share, amazed at how I narrowly avoided a potentially complicated entanglement. This story is not about me, but happened to my sister, Anna. Anna decided to meet a guy named Tom through an online dating site. They had never seen each other before because back then, not everyone shared their photos online. This was a long time ago, around the early 2000s. She had been given directions to his place and decided to stop by after her work. When she got there and rang the bell, she was met by an older lady, probably in her 50s. Anna was quite surprised. The lady looked at her and asked, are you here for Tom? Who might you be? Anna replied, Yes, that's me. The older woman then said, Oh, I'm Tom's mom. It's nice to see he's making new friends. He's been quite down lately. He got hurt in a skiing accident not too long ago. By this point, Anna was feeling really confused but didn't want to be rude. She thought she'd at least see how things went. That's when Tom appeared, moving into the room in a wheelchair. He had been injured badly. Seeing him, Anna said, Hi, we had plans to meet today, explaining how they had arranged it over the internet. Tom seemed surprised but pleased. Oh, that's pretty cool. His mom then mentioned that Tom had been a bit out of it for the past few days. Anna kept telling me this story and each time she emphasized how strange and uncomfortable their first meeting was. But Anna didn't want to judge him just because he was in an accident and needed time to recover. However, Tom's mom seemed hesitant about the whole situation. So... While sitting in their living room, feeling awkward about what to do next, Tom suggested that Anna could push him around in his wheelchair for a while. The story grew more bizarre from there. As Anna spent time with Tom and his mother, she began to notice things that didn't add up. The house was filled with old pictures of Tom, looking completely different from the person in the wheelchair. And the more she talked to Tom's mom, the more she felt something was off. The mother talked about Tom's past in a way that seemed too detailed, almost as if she was trying too hard to convince Anna of who Tom was. As the evening went on, Anna decided to play along, pushing Tom around the house. But with every turn of the wheelchair, she felt a growing sense of unease. The house was large and old, with long hallways that seemed to twist and turn in confusing ways. Some rooms were locked, and Tom's mom would quickly change the subject whenever Anna asked about them. Anna's initial confusion turned into a creeping dread. 
She couldn't shake off the feeling that she was being watched, and every so often she would catch a glimpse of shadows moving just at the edge of her vision. Tom, on the other hand, seemed oblivious to the strange atmosphere, chatting away about his hobbies and interests before the accident. As the night drew in, Tom's mom insisted that Anna stay for dinner. The kitchen was dimly lit, and the food was unlike anything Anna had ever seen before. It was an awkward meal, with Tom's mom dominating the conversation, recounting stories of Tom's childhood that made him seem almost like a different person. Anna knew something was deeply wrong. The feeling in her gut told her that she needed to leave. But every time she made an excuse, Tom's mom would come up with a reason for her to stay longer. The house, with its creaking floorboards and whispering walls, felt like it was closing in on her. The story doesn't end here, but what happened next is something Anna refuses to talk about in detail. All she mentions is that the night took a turn for the worse, leading her to make a decision that she would never have considered before that day. The horror of that evening stayed with her, a chilling reminder of the danger lurking within the ordinary, the terror of meeting strangers, and the dark secrets that families might hide. After Anna got Tom ready for the outside, she dressed him in warmer clothes. Tom had trouble moving because of his injuries, but he could still talk and move his head a bit. His mom warned Anna that the medicine might make Tom feel strange or even pass out, and she gave Anna a phone number to call if anything went wrong. Anna started pushing Tom towards the restaurant. It was supposed to be close, just a few streets away, but pushing the wheelchair was hard work. Anna is not very tall or strong, and Tom was quite heavy for her to manage. But as they tried to find the restaurant, Tom kept getting mixed up. He couldn't remember the way properly and kept changing his mind about the directions. What should have been a short walk turned into a long journey. They got lost, going around in circles and ending up on the wrong streets. Anna was getting tired and frustrated. They had been wandering for over an hour and it was getting late. Finally, she saw some people walking by and asked them for help. They knew the restaurant and told Anna it was actually very close. After wandering around for so long, they were relieved to find out they were just a couple of blocks away. When they finally arrived at the restaurant, Anna was exhausted but relieved. They chose a table outside, as planned. The evening air was cool, and the restaurant's lights gave a comforting glow. But as they settled down, Anna couldn't shake off the uneasy feeling that had been growing inside her since she entered Tom's house. The strange journey to the restaurant, Tom's confusion, and the odd behavior of his mom made Anna feel like something was not right. As they started to order their food, Tom's behavior became even more peculiar. He seemed distracted, looking around nervously as if he was expecting someone or something to appear. Anna tried to engage him in conversation, but his responses were vague and disjointed. The more they talked, the more Anna realized that there was something deeply unsettling about the whole situation. The night air grew colder, and the street around them became quieter. The other diners gradually left the restaurant, leaving Anna and Tom alone outside. The waiter came to check on them, his expression showing a hint of concern as he looked at Tom. Anna thanked him and tried to reassure him that everything was fine. But deep down, she knew it wasn't. As they waited for their food, Anna noticed Tom's attention kept drifting to a particular alleyway across the street. His eyes would narrow, and he would fall silent, as if listening for something, Anna felt a chill run down her spine. She tried to convince herself that it was just the cold or perhaps the aftereffects of Tom's medication, but the feeling of unease grew stronger, making her wish they had never come to this place. The night was turning into something Anna had not anticipated, a mixture of fear and curiosity keeping her from insisting they leave. She didn't know it yet, but this evening was about to take a turn that would haunt her for the rest of her life. The place they chose was an Italian spot, known for its wide variety of pizzas and pastas. Anna found a nice spot outside for them to sit, making sure Tom's wheelchair was safely locked to prevent any accidents. Once settled, Anna went inside to grab menus and order something to drink. Tom wanted a beer, and she opted for a soda. When she returned, Tom mentioned he needed help adjusting in his seat. That's when things took a bad turn. While trying to help, Anna accidentally hit the wrong lever on the wheelchair, causing the footrest to swing inwards and Tom's leg to drop suddenly to the ground. The sound of his heel hitting the concrete was loud, 
and Tom's reaction was immediate and intense. He screamed as if he was in terrible pain, making Anna panic, fearing she had hurt him badly. The scene attracted the waiter's attention, who came over with their drinks, unsure of how to help. Tom was in so much pain, crying and screaming, that they had to call for an ambulance. It turned out that Anna had accidentally triggered a nerve in Tom's back that was sensitive due to his injury. The sudden movement and shock to his system, despite the pain medication, caused his reaction. This event turned out to be the worst date Anna had ever experienced, and it deeply affected her. She felt guilty and worried for Tom, even though she had tried to help. The thought of causing someone pain, even accidentally, was distressing for her. They ended up going to the hospital together since Tom didn't have any family with him at the time. Anna called Tom's mother to inform her about the situation, and she promised to meet them at the emergency room. At the hospital, doctors checked Tom over, conducting scans and tests to ensure there wasn't any serious damage. Fortunately, Tom was okay, just shaken by the incident. He needed time to recover fully. Anna told Tom to reach out once he was better so they could try going on a date again, under better circumstances. However, Tom never called her back. Anna often shared this story, and while they could laugh about it now, it was a reminder of how quickly situations can change, and how important it is to be careful and considerate of others' conditions. It was a lesson in empathy and understanding, wrapped up in an unforgettable and somewhat tragic date night. I matched with a girl on Tinder. Funny thing, I recognized her from pictures with friends on Instagram. I couldn't remember if we went to school together because it's been so long, almost 10 years. We decided to meet since she seemed nice, friendly, and quite pretty. Back then I was working really late, finishing around 10 p.m. She was okay with my schedule, so we planned to hang out at the local park to relax a bit. It was late, and we found ourselves sitting by the lake, watching ducks glide by in the calm water. The park was empty, adding to the peaceful atmosphere. I don't recall the weather that day but one moment from that night is etched into my memory forever. We were enjoying the quiet of the park, sharing a joint, feeling relaxed and at ease. Suddenly, she began to vomit uncontrollably on the bench. I was taken aback, unsure of what to do. Instinctively, I started to pat her back, trying to offer some comfort, just like my parents did when I was sick. It seemed to help, or at least I hoped it did. But there I was, trying to make her feel better as she got sick, unsure of what to do next. It was an awkward moment. Thankfully, after about 10 minutes, she stopped. She told me she had been drinking all day before our meetup, which made me feel upset. Knowing she was responsible for her condition, rather than it being something out of her control like food poisoning, really bothered me. I had high hopes for our meeting. We had been texting for weeks and finally decided to meet at this park. Everything was going well until she started getting sick and admitted to drinking the whole day. I arranged for her ride home through Uber and paid for it. As the car arrived, she tried to pull me in with her, insisting I come along. But I made it clear I needed to go back to my place alone. She wouldn't get into the car at first, and despite having paid, I had to firmly insist. The situation had completely turned me off. It was clear she had some issues, whether they were emotional or related to alcohol, and I didn't want any part of it. The argument almost made the Uber driver leave without us. After about 15 minutes of arguing, she realized she had no other option. She couldn't come to my place, and I was adamant about it. I was paying for her ride, which would take about 15 minutes to get her home. Finally, she got into the car, started crying, and I closed the door behind her, asking the driver to go. Then, I walked away as fast as I could in the other direction. Reflecting on the situation, I realized the risks of online dating. The pictures and profiles don't always match up with reality. It's a sad and scary truth that our way of dating can lead to so many people feeling hurt and damaged by their experiences. This night was a stark reminder to always be cautious about who you meet from dating apps. It was a normal Sunday. My shift ended at noon and I hurried home sweating a lot. When I tried to open my door, I found out we had no electricity. I was working in a faraway clinic, and my small house had no generator. I'll just take a shower and go, I decided. As I prepared for my meeting, 
I noticed I couldn't find many of my things. If I found my bag, my ring was missing. If I grabbed my makeup, my eye pencil was gone. It felt like it took ages to get ready, and I was getting more upset by the minute. I was so frustrated that I ignored my phone completely. Turns out, he had been waiting in his car below and kept calling me. I missed 15 calls from him as I rushed around my home looking for my lost items. By then, I figured out he had gone to buy something from the store because he was tired of waiting. I decided to walk to meet him. When I got to the main road, it was packed with cars and motorcycles, all honking and yelling. Eventually, I found him. We sat quietly in his car, waiting to move, as he now agreed to drive me the rest of the way. Okay, we'll get to our spot soon, I thought. After a bit, the traffic cleared, and we moved on. I talked about my morning at work, and he listened, occasionally smiling with his weary eyes from his own long night shift. Then his phone rang. A neighbor had an accident and needed help. We were already halfway there, and turning back seemed pointless. He told them to head to the local clinic while we would handle the arrangements. He arrived at the clinic well before they did, and told me to wait in the car. So, there I was, supposed to be on a date, yet here helping him with a neighbor at a clinic. What was I even doing? He was running back and forth inside the clinic, while I sat waiting in the car in the parking area. I kept looking at the clinic's door, hoping to see them arrive. It took them an hour to get there, and only after he made sure everything was okay did we finally leave. By then, it was already 5 p.m. Our planned lunch date had turned into an evening one. We made it to a restaurant, placed our orders, and waited hungrily for our food. When our tandoori chicken arrived, I thought, finally something good. But as soon as we took a bite, it felt like our mouths were on fire. The chicken was so spicy, it made us cry rivers. We were gasping for air, making a scene in front of everyone. It was as if we were eating blazing coals. Despite gulping down water and sodas, the burn lingered and traveled down our throats. The waiters even brought us milk jugs, trying to ease our agony. It seemed the chef had gone overboard with the spices on our chicken. Though they claimed each dish was made to order, this one had an unbearable amount of spice. I used to have asthma as a kid, and without my inhaler I felt like I couldn't breathe. Across the table his eyes turned red, and I couldn't help but think how this date could get any worse. And indeed, it had. Right after we'd already waited four hours because of his neighbor. I appreciate the kindness of helping others, especially those without family, but our date was delayed so long. And then, our meal was ruined on the first bite. I couldn't eat solid food for days afterward surviving on banana smoothies and ice cream. The pain was so intense at times I considered visiting the emergency room. Luckily, the severe discomfort lasted only the first couple of nights, though swallowing was incredibly painful. The whole experience was so humiliating I never spoke to him again. I hope he fared better than I did, but that day definitely didn't go as planned for either of us. I matched with a very cute girl on Tinder. After chatting for many days, we decided to meet up for dinner one evening. It took a lot of bravery for me to finally ask her out. Her name was Emma, and she was quite short, around 5 feet tall, with a very pretty face. She had long, shiny blonde hair that looked really nice, so we planned to eat at a place in Austin. I can't recall the name, but it was a simple spot where you could get burgers, fries and pizza. It wasn't fancy, but I was excited just to see her in person. I've always been a bit shy, and this was only my third date ever. As the date got closer, I became more and more nervous. I even bought this herbal tea that was supposed to help you relax. This wasn't a regular tea bag kind of tea, but a powdered herb you had to measure out by yourself. Choosing to buy this self-measure herb was my first big mistake. I think it was called Kratom, or something similar. It was meant to make you feel happy and calm. I thought it would help me be more like myself during the date. I knew I felt more confident around women when I had a bit to drink, but I knew that wasn't a good solution. I needed to find a different way to bring out my best side. So, I ordered this herb from Amazon and thought I'd give it a shot. I never tried it before the night of our date. That Saturday evening, three hours before our meeting, I decided it was time to try the herb. I boiled some water and then I added about two small teaspoons of the powder into it. I mixed it until it dissolved and started to drink it. To be honest, it tasted awful, but I wasn't drinking it for the taste. 
I wanted to calm my nerves and be more confident. After finishing my cup, I waited for it to start working. As I waited, the city of Austin seemed to grow more and more distant, like a backdrop to a play I was no longer sure I was a part of. The evening air felt heavy, laden with anticipation and an unspoken fear that crept up my spine. Emma's image in my mind started to warp, from the cute smiling photo on Tinder to a shadowy figure that seemed to flicker in and out of my anxious thoughts. The very idea of meeting her now carried a weight of dread, as if I was walking into a scene not of a romantic dinner, but of a horror story where the lines between reality and nightmare blur. The simple act of preparing for a date had transformed into a prelude to an evening filled with unknown terrors, the first step down a path that promised to be anything but ordinary. I was sitting on the sofa all dressed up. No, I didn't wear a suit. I remember I chose jeans, sneakers, and a hoodie. We were both just 19 years old, but as I sat there, I felt nothing. I was just waiting, hoping my nerves would settle down. Instead, they seemed to get worse as time ticked by. I sent her a message to make sure she was still coming at 7. She said yes, so it was all confirmed. The only issue was, the Kratom Herb wasn't helping. It wasn't calming me down at all. My heart started to beat faster, and my breathing changed. I've had problems with anxiety before, and I knew this was a bad sign, but I decided to go ahead anyway. I went back to the kitchen, grabbed the jar, and took seven spoonfuls with new tea. After drinking it all, I waited another five to ten minutes. Finally, it started to work. I began to feel more relaxed, almost like I was ready for bed, but just lying there, peaceful and content. I felt ready for the date, but also a bit sleepy. I called an Uber and went to the restaurant, arriving just in time to meet her. I had to wait for about five minutes inside before she arrived. We had reserved a table in the corner, which was nice because it gave us a view of the road, something to talk about if we ran out of topics. As we began talking and had our starters, which I think included tortillas, some wraps and drinks, I noticed my tiredness fading. However, my nerves didn't return. Instead, a sharp pain started in my stomach. I began to worry because I recognized this feeling. It was the mistake I knew I shouldn't have made. I had taken too much kratom, and now I was paying the price. As the evening progressed, my body started to react badly, and we were only a bit into our date. Surprisingly, everything seemed to be going well. I was talking confidently, asking her questions, and we seemed to really hit it off. I think she was into me. Maybe my height at over six foot two played a part. But I felt good, without any sign of nerves. But then, my stomach twisted in pain. While we were eating tortillas and waiting for our main dishes, I felt unbearable sharp pains. I had no choice but to rush to the bathroom where I started to throw up uncontrollably. The green tea I had drunk was coming back up, mixed with bits of the tortillas and starters we had just had. Panic set in. I was alone, thankfully and tried to clean up the mess as best as I could. But the thought of facing her after this was daunting. I had to make a choice. Leave the restaurant without a word, or explain the situation to her. I was about to try and explain when another wave of nausea hit me. This time I couldn't stop vomiting. A guy walked in, saw me in distress, and went to get a staff member. Between bouts of sickness I explained what happened, making sure they knew it wasn't their food's fault but because I had taken too much green tea, aiming for relaxation, but ending up overdosing on it. They then explained the situation to my date, Amelia, who was understandably worried, but couldn't enter the men's bathroom. After what felt like forever, the ambulance came. They gave me a pill and an injection to stop the vomiting right in my butt, but it worked wonders. I stopped throwing up and started to feel a bit more like myself. I tried to clean up, but the manager insisted it was fine. The main thing was for me to get home safe. That night was mortifying. As I was leaving with the medics, I managed to speak to Amelia and tell her the truth about what happened. Being honest with her, instead of making up some excuse or fleeing, felt freeing. This ended up being one of the most embarrassing yet enlightening experiences of my life. It taught me to face my fears directly and authentically. I lived around 25 minutes away from him, so we decided to meet at the seaside pier, which was roughly in the middle for both of us. Before we planned to meet, we had been messaging, and he seemed completely fine. 
I was already waiting at the pier when he sent me a message. He couldn't come there because his driving license had been taken away and it was too far for him to walk. I should have just gone home, but I agreed to meet him at a pizza shop nearer to his place. Walking there took a while, but I finally made it and stood outside waiting when I spotted him. Right away I noticed that he didn't look like his pictures at all, which must have been taken three to five years ago. He looked really unkempt, as if he hadn't taken a bath in days, his hair was a mess, and his shirt had holes in it. I felt awkward, but managed to give him a quick hug, and suggested we get a table inside. He replied, Oh no, we're not here for pizza, let's head to the park. I hesitantly agreed, trying to keep the conversation going as we walked. I noticed his teeth and the ring on his tongue were stained black from smoking, which turned me off completely, but I tried to remain polite and respectful. When we reached the park and found a bench, he didn't let me sit. Instead, he pulled me onto his lap, squeezing me tightly and calling me, Good baby girl, you're so cute. I tried to move away and start a conversation. He took out his phone and began texting, not really listening to me. Suddenly he asked, Have you ever smoked? He mentioned his friend could get us something to smoke back at his place. I said no. He seemed surprised and tried to persuade me saying, Oh my gosh, why not? It'll be fun, just try it once. I refused again. Then, unexpectedly, he pulled me closer and whispered, You're so innocent, before he licked my face from my chin to my ear. Shocked, I just sat there, trying to understand what just happened as he continued to talk about smoking. I had to pretend there was an emergency call and left as soon as possible. I met a man on a dating app, and from our chats he seemed okay. In his profile he looked ordinary and said he was almost six feet tall. But when we met, he was as short as me, and I'm only five of five. Starting a date with a lie isn't the best sign. I had already walked a long way to get there, so I decided to see how it goes. We chose a small plates restaurant for lunch. He sat down first without waiting for me, taking the more comfortable seat, so I ended up in a chair. He ordered eight different dishes without asking me and I had to ask if we were supposed to share them. Before the food arrived, he kept saying how small the dishes were and that we'd need to eat again later, giving me weird looks as he said it. He complained about this at least three times and then started saying that small plates were a trick by restaurants to charge more for less food. I suggested we get some drinks, realizing I'd need them to get through this. Thankfully, he didn't object to drinking. By this point, I was more interested in the food than listening to him but I didn't want to cause a scene and go back to work hungry. As we waited, he began talking about his ex-girlfriends, all of whom were Asian because he liked how compact they were, which was strange. I tried to change the subject. When I mentioned I went to school in Philly, he bragged about his times at a strip club called Atlantis. Once the food arrived, he didn't stop talking, sending bits of food flying as he ate messily like an animal. He boasted about being self-made even though his parents were wealthy surgeons and he lived in a fancy apartment in the city, cleaned by a maid who also did his grocery shopping. The food was good, but listening to him made me feel sick. I pretended I got a call from my boss and had to leave for work. When we asked for the bill, I think the waitress could tell I was uncomfortable and quickly brought it over. I quickly took out my card, hoping to escape as soon as possible. In this new place, the air felt heavy, filled with an unsettling silence as we sat. The man's constant complaints and odd stares made the atmosphere even more uncomfortable. The small plates of food, which should have been a delight, became a backdrop to a growing sense of dread. His comments about his preferences for compact women and his brags about wealth and privilege revealed a disturbing lack of empathy and understanding. As the meal progressed, my discomfort turned into a deep unease. His obliviousness to social cues and his unrelenting monologue on personal achievements and shallow observations left me eager to escape. The quaint restaurant, once promising a cozy lunch, now felt like a trap, with every word from him tightening the snare. I was trapped in a horror story of social awkwardness and unchecked ego, desperately looking for an exit. Then, as I was getting my card out to pay, he started talking about how he often dates women who consider themselves feminists. He said they never offer to pay but he noticed and liked that I had offered to split the bill. I've heard similar things on other dates, and I know talking about such things is not good for a first date. Suddenly, he switched topics to politics, praising how a leader was going to save our country. 
It took him forever to figure out the tip, and he ended up giving less than 10%. Seeing this, I decided to leave more, about 25%. But then he started lecturing me about how tipping too much is ridiculous, mentioning everything from taxis to building staff. Even though I might agree to some extent, this was definitely not a conversation for a first date. It was just one red flag after another. After we left the restaurant, he said he worked in the city center, but insisted on walking me back to my office, which was quite far. He didn't seem to understand that I didn't want him to come with me as if he were learning something from me at work. I had to be clear and tell him he couldn't follow me, but instead of understanding, he tried to kiss me. I got scared and tried to turn away, but he grabbed my arm and wouldn't let go until I pushed him away hard. He didn't take the hint and tried to kiss me again, this time more aggressively, which was disgusting. I aimed to defend myself, and because we were the same height, my knee hit him hard in the stomach. He looked like he was either going to throw up or try another kiss. My only reaction was to hit him and then run away. When I looked back, he was curled up on the ground. Despite everything, I didn't think he was a bad person, just very, very lost. The walk back to my office was filled with mixed feelings. The busy streets seemed to reflect back my turmoil, with people bustling by, unaware of the distressing encounter I had just experienced. The man's actions, his inappropriate comments, and the unsettling end to our meeting left me feeling deeply uncomfortable. The daylight did little to dispel the sense of unease that clung to me. A stark reminder of how quickly a seemingly normal situation could turn into something out of a horror story. My mind raced as I navigated through the crowd, the city's soundscape a blur around me. This was supposed to be a simple lunch date, yet it had spiraled into an episode filled with fear and the need to escape. The horror of the experience wasn't just in the physical altercation, but in the realization of how quickly one's sense of safety could be shattered, a true horror in the light of day. After watching a scary movie with a guy I met online, let's call him Jack, we went back to my place. I mentioned we could hang out for a while, but I needed to sleep soon because of work the next morning. Jack was okay with it, but said he was hungry and wanted to order some food. Fine by me. He ordered two big sandwiches and a milkshake from a local shop. A bit much, but no big deal. He was a tall guy, over six feet and looked strong. Still young and probably not done growing. I didn't think much of it then. We ended up cuddling and fell asleep. Suddenly I woke up around one in the morning because I heard my front door opening and closing many times. My dogs were barking like crazy. What was Jack doing? I opened my bedroom door, which leads to the rest of my apartment, and saw the bathroom light on. The door was wide open. I walked closer and saw Jack squatting by the toilet, using a stick to poke at a dark, nearly overflowing mess in the toilet. He looked up, panicked, and told me to go back to my room, insisting he had everything under control. Half asleep and confused, I couldn't help but laugh nervously. I didn't know how to react. He asked why I didn't have a proper plunger, and I said I'd never needed one before. Again, he told me not to worry, and to go back to bed. Disturbed and tired, I went back to my room, still needing to wake up early. Later I heard Jack say he fixed it before he left my apartment. In the morning, I cautiously checked the bathroom. The water had gone down, but there was something sticking out from the bottom of the toilet. Looking closer, I found the end of a stick, some gloves, towels, and barbecue tongs. I managed to pull out a long stick broken into pieces. Jack had tried using several sticks to unclog the toilet and left a mess everywhere. He had been going in and out to find sticks in the yard, breaking each one he tried. My bathroom was a disaster and Jack had rushed out so quickly he left his clothes on my floor. After work, I bought a plunger right away. I learned my lesson 